If you would stand, our scripture reading this morning is Genesis chapter 6. A little lengthy, verses 5 through 22. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 22. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, Take your, for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let the word of the Lord we just read swirl around your minds and your hearts throughout this morning's message because we're coming back to Genesis. But as always, I want to set the table because we are in Paul's letter to the Colossians chapter 1, <clears throat> discussing from verse 26, the mystery. The end of verse 25, Paul proclaims he is to preach the word of God, which is the mystery hidden from past ages and generations. Why? And we are we started last week. This is part two of what will probably be part a part five or six uh, by the time we're through with it. But I want to I'm taking this time because I want us to see what God has given us in his word, how he has laid out for us to be able to go back since we have the full revelation to see the mystery of Christ that was hidden. Our focus is that word hidden. Last week, we went back to Genesis chapters uh, 1 and 2, the creation account there. Where is Christ? We see Christ in Adam. And our specific focus at that time was Adam and his, his function in the Garden of Eden. There we see the, the words of chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Genesis. God lays forth that, that Adam, in his original creation was essentially to be, king, to be king of the earth. He was to have dominion over all things. He was to be fruitful and multiply 
and fill the earth. Just as Christ is our prophet, priest, and king originally, we see in Adam the prophet, priest, and king type and shadow. His dominion, his kingship, also extended to be a priest. And we looked at how the Garden of Eden, Adam was created from the earth. He was put on the earth. He was given the word of God to be fruitful and multiply and cultivate the earth. But very specifically, which he could have done, but God gave him the garden, built the garden itself to where Adam was to cultivate and keep it. And as we looked at, there's three other times those two Hebrew words are put together and it describes in, in the book of Numbers the Levite's priestly service to the temple to keep it, to guard it, and to cultivate it, to work it. That was their, their job, their responsibility. So we have this temple language all the way back in Genesis, the creation account. Adam was a priest. The garden was a temple. And that original um, plan for Adam to be fruitful and multiply as he had children, his children had children, the garden was to expand and cover the whole earth. Adam was not created eternal. There was a work for Adam to do. And, 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 and the glory of that passage is God intimates that when that work is done, then Adam would come to glory. Then he would be eternal and have eternal life. So he was a king, he was a priest, but he was also prophet because God gave Adam his word. God gave a command to Adam alone. And you look at chapter 2 there. Adam was not created until the end after God had given Adam his word and placed him in the garden of Eden. So only Adam received the word, the command of to eat of every tree except one, the tree of the good, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So as God's prophet, his as God's receiver of his word, he was to preach that, to teach that to his wife, to his children, and subsequently to all generations. But Adam fell. Adam sinned. And he lost his kingship. He lost his priesthood. And he lost his prophetic responsibility. But it is a type and a shadow that points ahead to the prophet, priest, and kingship of Christ, who is now at the present time and will bring all things to fruition, who is spreading to every tribe, no, tongue, nation, and people the good news of his gospel. It is spreading, and it will come to an end and culminate in that at the time that the Father has established. That was our first look at what was hidden. But again, I want to always remind you, week after week, of Colossians 1.9, that we would be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That takes place first, and that's what we're doing um, over the next several weeks, looking at Christ throughout the Scriptures, the mystery that was hidden. Because once we've received that, then, verses 10 through 12, the purpose of that, to walk in a manner worthy of Christ, to please God in all respects, those, those things start taking on a weightier meaning for us. A reality, God's reality for the Christian life. Our overall context here, this section is verses 24 through chapter 2, verse 5. And I'm not going to read that so you can... We can skip over those if they're not even up there. That's okay. If I looked up more, I would probably know that. But our context here points backwards. So our next aspect of what was hidden, we're going to look at God's covenant with Noah. How is Noah, not just what we read in, in chapter 6, but verses 7, 8, and 9, the covenant that God established with Noah, and subsequently also all creation. It is a, a complete creation covenant. How does that fit in the mystery of Christ? It's, I'm going to give you the answer right up front, but please don't turn to me out, okay? 
Why did the flood take place? To judge sin. Why did God save Noah? So that the line of Christ would continue. That's the purpose. When we have what we have in Genesis chapter 5, the genealogy from Adam until Noah up until the flood, that is only speaking of the line of Christ. Because it says repeatedly, each of those individuals, Adam had many other sons and daughters. We're not told about them. We're only given the line of Christ. And that line had to be preserved because God has to punish sin. And, and the sad thing about this is Noah, out of every person on the planet, is the only one found righteous. God had to wipe out the wicked because with one righteous man, right? The wicked doesn't tolerate the righteous. At some point, just from a logical understanding, Noah would have been done away with. The line would have ended. But God is not about man. He is about his son. The focus is the son. So he sends the flood to preserve the life of Noah and his family to continue the line of Christ. Which Luke chapter 3 verse 36 tells us. And that genealogy, Noah is listed there. He is in this line. And it's so amazing to me over and over again how the Holy Spirit has inspired his word. It tells us exactly what we need. It gives us exactly what we need if we would only read it and look. Christ is everywhere throughout here. And I think this passage concerning the flood and the account of Noah is one of the most relative aspects for our life today. Because this is what we're waiting for. This is what's coming next. The judgment of sinners and the destruction of this present world to bring in the new heavens and the new earth. That's the simple reality. That's what we're waiting for. And I think it's so important for us to always keep this account of the flood and Noah in mind. Because it is the relevant text for us today. So today we're going to focus on the, the line of Christ. We're going to look at uh, the covenant that God made with Noah. And then we'll look at the subsequent verses where Noah is mentioned throughout the rest of the scriptures. But God gives... Uh, essentially, the flood account and his covenant with Noah is a retelling of the creation story. It, God's not resetting the system. The flood account, the flood narrative is an echo of creation. There's so many creation similarities here. And, 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 and they're not pertinent for our focus on Christ this morning. But we're going to talk a lot about them tonight. So I would really encourage you to come. There's some cool stuff we're going to look at tonight in regard to expanding the Word of God and our knowledge of the Word of God um, and how perfect the Word of God is. But this morning is the, is the covenant with Noah. And essentially, the covenant with Noah is to bring about civilization. God makes a faithful promise once the flood is over that He's never going to do it again. He's never going to destroy man in this way again. He is going to destroy man. But it won't be by the water of the earth. God sent the flood to punish sin, to preserve the line of Christ, and to, and to echo creation for us. Things are different this time. He's not setting up Noah in a new garden to temple the earth again. That's done. That's gone, that's gone away. That's reserved for Christ alone. What, what God is doing is setting up the civilization needed and necessary to bring in Christ. And because God has made a covenant with Adam and or Noah and all creation forevermore, this is for us today. It's so relevant. It's not something that we can overlook what God has given us. Because what God wants, what God orchestrates here is how we are to live Still today, as much as we can, as this world system will allow. But just because things are different doesn't mean God's plan is thwarted. It's the same plan, it's the same purpose, now, always, and forever. But let's look at the covenant. Genesis chapter 9, 
We're not going to read the whole account of, of what takes place um, throughout the flood. But Genesis chapter 9, the flood is over. Um, Noah and his family are leaving the ark. And God gives his covenant to Noah and to all the earth. The first thing we want to look at is God's godly justice. Why did he destroy the earth? Because it was nothing but violence. What do we see in our day? A love of violence. There's nothing new under the sun. All we've done is repeat everything from the past. But Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 through 7, God says this. He establishes his godly justice for murder. He says, surely, verse 5, I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require it, and from every man, from every <clears throat> man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood will be shed. For in the image of God he has made him. As for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly, and multiply on it. We have a repeat of what God told Adam to be fruitful and multiply. But this time, there's something extra. Murder is not tolerated. Murder prevents society's advancements. We're not told a lot about what was taking place and the overall civilization of life from Adam until Noah. Other than the fact that it was exceedingly violent, everyone was murdering and doing their own thing. There was no respect for life whatsoever. But in order for society to advance, in order for civilization to advance, life must be honored. I will just mention a few topics. It's an issue today. It's been an issue for a while. The death penalty. God's for it. That's all I'm going to say. If you don't agree with that, your, your, your issue is not with me or what I say. Your issue is with God's word. God says to preserve life. At the same time, this function, the function of this, this initial part of the covenant is not just to preserve life, but it's to preserve the family. Verse 6 preserves life. Verse 7 of chapter 9 preserves the family. How important family is. But we live in a society where we want to exonerate murderers but kill our children. Family can't exist when you don't have children. It doesn't matter where you fall on the abortion issue. If it doesn't align with this passage of scripture, you're wrong. That's all I'm going to say about that for now. Genesis 9, verses 8 through 17, after God gives his godly justice, he gives his promise of preservation, not only to Noah, but to all creation itself. Verse 8, if you have a copy of the Word of God and you're not looking at your copy of the Word of God, look at your copy of the Word of God, please. I want you to see it. Don't trust me. One day I, I'm going to read something that isn't right just to see if you're paying attention. It's not going to be today, but let's see what the word of God says. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you. It doesn't get any better than that. Noah doesn't have to do anything but listen to what God is saying. God is giving his covenant. God is making his covenant with man and with creation for man's good and for creation's good. That's what God's covenants do. I've made it with you, God says, and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the, of the earth with you. Of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you, every living creature that is with you, for all successive generations. 
I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and, and the earth. It shall come about when I, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow will be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. If you think man is going to destroy the earth by fake man-made climate change, you're wrong based on the covenant of God. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> Nothing else needs to be said. God has promised it will be done. Verse 16. When the bow is in the cloud and I will look upon it to remember, note these words, they are going to come up again, I to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The covenant, the covenant of God applies to every person. There is no exception. You value life because God values life. You trust that there, this earth is going to continue and what this means in a deeper sense, is God's plan, as we are looking at the mystery of Christ, will come to fruition. It did come to fruition. And because God has given us a plan from Christ, first coming to second coming, that is established as well. Nothing is going to change that. Nothing is going to thwart it. Nothing that we can do will ever change God's plan. Amen. After the flood, the people of God were one. They got together to create the Tower of Babel because they were going to heaven. How did that turn out? The whole world can get together today with one solid plan. God will end it. And he has ended it over and over and over again. Why? Because he is faithful to his promise. Amen. Amen. In Genesis chapter 8, just back one chapter, the very last verse, verse 22, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night, remember those two words, they're coming up again, shall not cease. Shall not cease. No matter what, God will fulfill his promise. We don't live in a temple kingdom that was established at creation any longer, but we do live under God's kingdom, a kingdom of creation, as Samuel Renahan said, a kingdom of creation, a common curse kingdom of common grace. Everybody falls under God's common grace and the common curse. But what has God said more than this? What do the scriptures tell us more about this covenant with God? First off, let's look at God's promised faithfulness. Isaiah chapter 54, verses 9 and 10. Isaiah 54, 9 and 10. For this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you nor will I rebuke you, speaking to Israel, for the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Why is God's faithful? What is God's faithfulness in this passage to Israel based upon? The covenant of Noah. His faithfulness. Jeremiah 33, verses 19 through 26. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord, If you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant, so that he will not have a son to reign on his throne and with the Levitical priests. The hidden mystery. Based on what? I remember, I told you just a few minutes ago, 
Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, day and night. Why does Jeremiah mention that? If, I can, if you can break my covenant for the day and the night, it's not going to happen. Noah is not mentioned in this passage, but the promise of Genesis 8 and 9 is. Jeremiah continues there. My ministers, as the host of heaven, cannot be counted, and the sand of the sea cannot be measured. So I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister to me, the king and priest. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not observed what this people have spoken? They're saying, The two families which the Lord chose, he has rejected them. Thus they despise my people. No longer are they as a nation in their sight. Thus says the Lord. He repeats it again. When something's repeated in Scripture, we need to take note of it. We need to remember it because it's important. Again, God says, If my covenant for day and night stand not in the fixed patterns of heaven and earth, I have not established, then I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David my servants, not taking from his descendants rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. If the covenant is broken, there is no Christ. That's what God's saying. If the covenant is broken, my servant, my king, my priest, my prophet doesn't come. And what's it hinged upon? The renewed covenant with Noah. God is faithful to his promise. We sang that just a little bit ago. Faithful to his promise ever here with us. But not only is God, as Noah mentioned throughout the scriptures regarding God's faithfulness, like I said at the beginning, what, what, what is more relevant for us today, not over God's faithfulness, but for us to understand, is the aspect of judgment. Noah's mentioned for faithfulness, and he's mentioned again for judgment. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 3 through 6. I'll give you a second to get there. Isaiah 24, verses 3 through 6. <clears throat> Note what it said. Verse 3. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for the Lord has spoken his word. The earth mourns and withers. The world fades and withers. The exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed the laws, violated statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. I told you to remember that those words. Where did they come from? God's covenant with Noah. What if they violated? They broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. There is a day of judgment coming. Isaiah is prophesying. The future based on the covenant with Noah, the everlasting covenant that was violated. Jesus picking this up in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 and 38. He says, for the coming of the son of man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Eating, drinking, marrying. From the text we just read of Isaiah 24, the turmoil of the earth, the transgression of the laws, the violation. And what was in that broken, everlasting covenant? The value of life. The value of life. Disregarded. But it's going to come upon 
the generation it comes upon, whether it's today or 500,000 years from now, it's coming. And it's going to be a day of judgment, and people are not going to be under where under they're not going to be aware. They're going to be under their own deception. They're not going to understand when Christ comes what's taking place. And it's going to be too late because the judgment, as Isaiah chapter 24 said, is fire. Amen. It's over. It's done. There is no more. There are so many self-deceived individuals today who are living it up, unaware that when that day comes, they're out of options. The same type of judgment, full and complete, but not only judgment, not only God's faithfulness, but also Noah's mentioned for his righteousness by faith. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Why was, God, why was Noah righteous? We'll look at this a little bit. We'll expand this a little bit more tonight when we look at the progression of chapter 6. But Noah found grace, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time, and he walked with God. Why? Why did he walk with God? Why was he righteous? We'll look at that tonight, but the essence is his righteousness is mentioned, and it's by faith. It takes great faith to live in a destructive world and to stand alone. Amen. That's the cause of the, of the Christian. That's, right. That's our life, to stand when everybody else is denying while everybody is laughing and playing and making arrangements on this life, we have something better. We have a better home to go to, a better country, an eternal life. Not a vapor of this one. Not a, sudden, a suddenly fleeting nothingness. When I was a little kid, 45 years old was old. I'm not there yet. But now that I'm in my early 40s, 80's not old. Amen. Right, Brother Her? Amen. <laughs> but, but it's still just a small, insignificant amount of time compared to what has gone before us and what will come after us. But it is by the righteousness of faith that Noah built the ark, entered with his family, and exited with the covenant of God. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 17 through 20 says, For it is better if God should will it so, listen to this Christian, that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that... He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who were once disobedient. When the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. We see the wonderful patience of God here. During the construction of the ark, which took about 100 years for Noah and his family to complete in which just a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. We see the patience of God to honor the one who was righteous before him, the one that he chose to show grace to. But lastly, I'm going to bring this back around as I mentioned judgment a minute ago. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Dear Christian, my brothers and sisters, we need to hold fast because judgment is coming. 
2 Peter 2, verse 5. And God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. God is the preserver of life. God will hold you fast. God will and is and has always had you secure in his hand. He will not falter. You will not slip away. You are preserved forever. But you are preserved for a great day for the believer, which is glory. But for the unbeliever, destruction. Child of God, hold fast. If you're here this morning and you love life in this earth, you're eating, drinking, and marrying, If your life is consumed with the things on this planet, check your heart because judgment is coming. You will be wiped off the face of the earth just as everybody else was in the flood. Only eight people made it. I have to to believe, even though the text doesn't say, when it started raining, the water started rising, people that were close were probably running to the ark. It's too late. When the trumpet sounds and the, and the glorious appearing of Christ takes place, it's too late. If you are not one of his sheep, you are one of his goats, you will be separated to destruction for all eternity. Today is the day of salvation. Do not wait. I beg you. The message of the flood and the message of the covenant with Noah is one of chaos. It is one of Christ's provision. And it is one of coming judgments. Is your soul right with God this morning? Are you prepared for that great day? Believer, are you pointing others to Christ? Are you, like Noah, a preacher of righteousness to everyone around you? You need to be. Because it's serious. Yes, God is patient. Yes, Noah preached righteousness for 100 years as he built the ark. But when the time came, it was too late. But just because no one else made it in the ark doesn't mean everyone you talk to won't make it to heaven. Be purposeful. Feel the reality of the coming judgment and fulfill the great, glorious gospel ministry that you've been given. We live in a very simple reality. This is what we're waiting for. Are we ready? Let's pray. Lord, I just pray this morning that our heart would be filled with urgency. The reality that those around us living in this world are lost and dying and headed for destruction. We proclaim to have words of life. We proclaim to have words of reconciliation and redemption and peace between God and man. Help us not to be lazy. Help us not to be unaware. Help us not to be diligent in the precious privilege and opportunity that we've been given to shine the light of Christ because we know he's coming. May we be fervent. May we be urgent. May we be intense for your sake, for your great name. Amen.